So before we get into content, we're going to do project architecture, specifically MVC and MySQL. Before we get into that, I want to talk about just a quick reminder of what next week is. So next week, it's definitely not spring break. Uh, don't don't refer to it as spring break because we don't have a spring break. I don't want to get in trouble. But uh, each lecture, I'll still be here. I'll still stream during the stream time. But these are, this is the one time you'll actually hear me say this, these are optional lectures. If you don't show up to anything during next week, if you don't do anything at all related to CSC 116, it's perfectly fine. I'm okay with that. I'll see you on the 22nd. No big deal. If you do want to show up, uh, I I'll, I created a Piazza post soliciting ideas for what you want to see. I'll do whatever. I'll just do whatever Piazza says or whatever chat says. I'll, I'll be here for you, whatever you want to see. If that means playing games, whatever. If it means reviewing 116 content, sure. If it means foreshadowing what's coming up, sure. Uh, I won't require anyone to know the content that I cover this week. So even if I do cover new stuff, I will cover that again in the actual lectures, assuming that you've never seen any of the, uh, uh, assuming you've never seen any of these lectures. So they're completely optional. No worries if you don't see them. They won't be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, you can watch them on the Twitch VOD if you miss them live and you are interested in what we did. Same with the lab. We're just going to hang out in lab. The TAs are talking about some things that you know they might set up possibly uh, playing Among Us or, or whatever, or just hanging out. Uh, we'll figure out, uh, you know, we'll just do whatever, whatever y'all want to do. Um, with this week, uh, it, it's going to be tempting to just catch up on things. Uh, so I do have one ask uh, for you this week. Uh, it'll be tempting to just get caught up and you'll be studying for other exams and stuff. But if you can at least take some time during this week to just focus on yourself, focus on your mental health, Take a complete break. Ideally, if you take an entire day and just don't do anything related to your courses and just relax and get yourself back in a better state. Uh, I know I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to take at least two days, either of Saturdays and or Sundays. Uh, I usually end up working at least a little bit every single Saturday and Sunday, every single day. Uh, so I'm going to try to take at least two of those four weekend days and just do absolutely nothing, not check my email, uh, probably not even carry my phone with me. And just unplug and, and unwind. Uh, I I would love it if all of you did the same thing. At least take one of those Saturdays or Sundays and do nothing related to school. And just unwind and get caught up on your, your mental health. Um, but everything, and uh, I swear I'm missing one thing here. Everything with 116 is optional this week. Oh, we will still have office hours. Uh, myself and the TAs will still hold our office hours. And all the scheduled stuff is still happening, but it's all optional. Uh, and, oh, and one last thing. When I do the schedule, when I made the schedule, I just pretended this week didn't exist. So if you do use this week to catch up, you do actually get an extra week for the LO2 stuff. We're not doing any any uh, deadlines like LO2. The um, self-checkout would normally be due on the 19th. But since this week doesn't exist, that ends up being due on the 26th. So if you are using this to catch up, that does mean you get an extra week. It is the first really intense project, so uh, so it does kind of make sense to do that anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, I know, it, Blitzkrieg. It's going to be tempting to just use all that time to... One of your courses is backing off for one week. You, you know, you might not even be able to get caught up by the end of that. It's going to be tempting to just work through it, but... Try to take uh, at least a little bit of time for yourself. And with that, let's... Uh... Oh, and the Piazza post. The, I, I want to give a little more details on that. So I made a Piazza post. A few of you have responded already. But whatever you want to see, post on that. Upvote the things that you want to see. Whatever gets upvoted the most, I'll unless it's absolutely ridiculous, I'll probably end up doing... Uh, unless it's like, I don't know, something offensive or something silly. I'll, I'll have a pretty high tolerance for what I'll do. Um... But uh, let me know what you want to do or what you want to see that week. A few of you have posted, so uh, if you like the things that have been posted, you know, click the upvote or whatever it's called on Piazza. Good, good comment, I think it is. Uh, click that button so I can see. And then whatever gets the most good comments. Uh, I'll certainly do that, and then I'll look at the other ones and see what else I can do. we got three lectures, so I can do quite a bit. Uh, but I won't be preparing any slides because uh, I want to kind of take a break, too, and get caught up on stuff. I'm not going to put a ton of time into preparing a lecture. 
but anything that we do, can do on the fly, like the one of the suggestions right now is to do live coding and build Flappy Birds. Um, you know, I can probably do that in three hours. So I could do that just during the lecture time, but I won't prepare off stream is what I mean by that, just in case you're wondering. All right, so with that, let's get into to today's content. And today, just like... I don't remember how much I stressed this on Wednesday, but just like Wednesday's lecture, I'm not requiring you, per se, to understand this uh, uh, this material in the sense that it won't show up on interviews, it won't show up on quizzes, and I won't ask you to uh, use this in the code that you write. But this does apply to code that I give you, and it will apply to code that I give you on the project contribution when that comes out. That's one of my things that I'm going to do next week. Get everything set up, all the logistics set up for the project contribution. That will use MySQL for those projects. So let's talk about these. And MVC, you've already seen this. You've been exposed to this on the current homework, the current project. So let's talk about what, what MVC is. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to go into that code. I closed the IntelliJ project, actually. I have to open it back up. Um, plays horror games? Oh, boy. My... Not, not to make it more tantalizing, but I uh, played a VR horror game. My wife is into horror movies. So I got this VA horror, uh, VR horror game for her. We put the Oculus on, and, and we're playing it. And she plays. She's like, oh, ho oh, hum, whatever. I've seen all this stuff before. I'm like, let me see that. Let me try it and see you know, what I got for you, why it's so boring. I freaked, the f I, I freaked out. <laughs> there was a... Uh, the jump scares are just so effective in VR. I don't know. But I just don't consume horror content at all. So, yeah, it, it messed. It, it got me. My wife was just laughing. Uh, so let's talk about MVC. This is a... Uh, I don't remember what game it was. Whatever the popular one was. I We got the, the Rift and uh, I just downloaded whatever the... It wasn't Friday Night at Freddy's. But... Uh, but it was whatever one they were selling for VR, the po most popular one, when I searched horror games. So uh, MVC is a software architecture pattern. This is different than the design patterns. Uh, we talked about the state pattern, and I mentioned that there are other ones that exist. Uh, this is different than design patterns, which are designed to solve a specific problem within a project. The An architecture pattern, like MVC, is designed to structure your entire project. This is a way to organize all of the code of your project. You organize all of your code into the this model, view, and controller for MVC. And it helps you stay organized. And as we'll see today, it has some benefits. It also has some downsides. I won't focus on the downsides today, but there are other approaches. If you Google like problems with MVC, you'll get all kinds of different architecture patterns that people are pitching uh, to try to replace MVC, but they all have a core in MVC. They all have the same idea, just implemented in different ways. So the idea is to take these three pieces and decouple them and keep these three completely separate from each other and have them communicate through APIs. And you can see this, I'll draw the analogies in the parallels um, to it uh, throughout this lecture, but you see this in your, uh, in your self-checkout project in the handout code I even have it organized into packages, a model, view, and controller package. The model is where you write all your code, and then there's a view and controller, which uh, together comprise the GUI, effectively. But we're going to explain what that is. So this has to do with APIs. This is a word. This is a an acronym I've been using for a while. Uh, I want to hopefully make this a little more concrete. This is kind of an abstract idea that we use in computer science, this idea of an API. And it has so many applications. We say API for a lot of different things. So I want to try one more time to nail this down a little bit harder uh, to hopefully get you understanding what an API is. Uh, so you you have written one of these already. Your web um, you've accessed web APIs in 115. You would access the API if this is even still what they do in 115. You would access the API, access an endpoint, and get like uh, crime data or traffic data, you get some data from an API, consume that with your code and then process it and then you would host it on your battle server. And your battle server would have its own API, which are, which are the endpoints that the front end can connect to. They did cut it last semester, all right. Um, Plotly has an API. I mean, APIs are literally everywhere that you see. Uh, like the, the methods in the math class, that's the math class's API. 
you call math dot sign sign is an api endpoint they're literally everywhere so it's hard to explain a concept when it's like you you can't write a line of code without using an api or two uh so it, you've seen apis before by name even in in 115 oh depending on what semester you took it apparently uh and we've seen apis in the state pattern the state abstract class defined the api of your of the class that will have the state attached to it those are the methods that can be called that are going to change behavior depending on the state so your abstract class controls the api that says these are the methods that can be called this is how you can access information or change information and then the implementation of each state would change the behavior of each api endpoint but the api is the list of methods that you can call to access that information or change information or get some behavior whatever you're trying to do with that endpoint uh, but that's the way you can interact with that object so what you know what? i don't even feel like talking about that slide uh, so with an API, do I? No, this is a new slide. I, I, I was reading it wrong. This is the, I'm like, what is this slide? It's a slide I just wrote last night. That's why I don't recognize it. It's brand new. So the implementation of the API is completely separate from the, uh, from the API itself. So the API defines the ways that you can access the data, kind of what, that object does or, or whatever it is that piece of code what it does and then the implementation when you actually go to say okay when this api endpoint is called what actually happens that's the implementation so for example when i give you a project objective i define the api for that objective in the document that i give you i say here are the methods that can be called and here's the behavior here's the functionality that you need to implement for that API. Like for your project, the API for your model, it's all the button presses and also the get uh, get receipt lines, uh, the receipt lines method and the display string method, along with all the button methods, the button press methods, that's the API. Now, when I write my solutions and upload them to the server and you write your solutions, we follow the same API. So our solutions, our implementations are accessed in the same way through those same method calls. And the behavior, as long as we're both implementing everything properly, you have your complete solution, the behavior will be identical in both of our solutions. But the way we implemented, the how did we get that behavior can, uh, can change quite a bit. I updated the title, didn't I? It should say 116 MVC MySQL. The, the how does it work? Like, I'm going to implement mine different than the way you're going to implement yours. So that's going to be way different, but we're going to get the same behavior, and we're following the same API. Thanks, Nicholas. And we're getting the same API. We're implementing the same API. So, for example, we can both write tests that test that behavior. Oops, spelled. At least one of those is wrong. It's spelled wrong. Uh, we can both write tests. Like you can write a test suite as long as you're complying to the API. You can use those tests to test your code, your implementation, or you can use those tests to test my code and my implementation. If we're both following the same API, which is defined by the project handout, then everything's fine. And this is where students get into trouble. If you write a method, if you create a new method that's not mentioned anywhere in the handout document you write a test suite that calls that method well now you're not following the api you expanded the api you changed that api and then when you submit your test to autolab those tests are trying to run against my code well my code follows the api from the document your code is following the api that you from the document plus something that you created and added to the api well my code doesn't do that so your tests break, and that's when you get the error while testing correct solution, error while testing incorrect solution. You're going to get all those errors because you didn't follow the API. APIs are a very critical part of programming and changing an API. For example, just having a method that takes a double as an input and changing that to an int, that's going to break any code that uses your API. 
For example, the next version of Scala comes out and it says, you know what, math.pow, instead of taking a double and a double, now it takes a double and an int. Well, that's going to break a lot of code. Any code out there that's using that math, that math objects API and giving that method two doubles breaks now. All of that code is broken. We're going to get errors everywhere. It's not a good idea. Once you agree on an API, it's very difficult to change because you have to change all the code that accesses that API. Just like I can't mid, mid assignment, like right now, I can't go into the project document for self checkout. I can't go in there and say, you know what? The instead of the number pressed method taking an int, I'm going to make 10 different methods called number pressed zero, number pressed one through number pressed nine. I can't make that change right now because that's going to break all of your code. And it's going to break my grader. I'd have to update the grader too. And now if you're submitting, you would have to change all of your code or else your submission is going to break. I can't change that API once you start the assignment. Once I release a document, I can't change that API because it's going to break all of our everything. Can't change APIs. So this has a lot of benefits though, because once we have an API defined, we can write code that accesses that API. And even when the functionality behind the API changes, as long as we're still complying with the API, the code using the API does not have to change. And that's going to be important when we dive into this MVC. So let's break apart the parts of MVC and uh, and just explain what each one of these are. So uh, the model, this is where all the action happens. This is where really the core, what I like to think of as the core of an app. Some people might disagree. Some people might think the core of the app is the display, more of a user focus, uh, user centric view. I think the core is the model. Uh, this is where all the stuff happens. This is the core of your app, and this is where uh, this is where you're handling data. This is where you're accessing a database. This is where everything is really happening. I have a whole slide on it. I don't want to spoil the next slide. Uh, the view. This is just visualizing the app to the user, and it doesn't do anything. But this is how human beings are able to see the app and actually experience the app and then the control this is handling user inputs whenever the user wants to interact with the app that's the controls job to take that those user inputs and communicate those inputs to the model by using the model's api it's like when a video game gets past the api being updated now the api isn't changing i mean maybe depending on the patch like the API for a video game, there are tons of APIs throughout any game. But the fundamental API is what button does what. If I press A, what happens? If I press up, what happens? If I use the left control stick, what happens? If I push right bumper, what happens? That's the, the game's API from the user perspective. That shouldn't change. So they shouldn't release a patch that says, oh, the A and B button, now we're going to swap those and they're going to do, you know, they're going to do each other's thing. Uh, they're not going to change that API because then a patch is going to change the way that you have to approach that game. But if all the buttons still do the same things and they fix like they patch a physics bug behind the scenes, you don't have to change anything you do. And then the game just works better because that bug was patched. But if they change the API, that would be changing the buttons on the controller with a patch. They might have changed an API internally where how their code accesses the physics engine. That might have changed, probably not, if they're doing, if they have good practices, uh, but possibly. Um, but they're not going to change the way you interact with the game. I mean, maybe they do. It, I mean, if the buttons are just completely awkward, maybe, maybe, <laughs> but they shouldn't. Has changing key bindings in the game not affect the API? It would. That's what I'm saying. That would be a, an API change if they change the key bindings you would notice if an API changes, anybody using the API is going to notice and they're probably going to be upset unless your API was really horribly designed and you made it better. Uh, so these are the three parts and visually looks like this. We have our user who's going to enter some inputs into the controller 
the controller is going to take those user inputs and convert them into commands that will be sent to the model in the form of API calls. The model is going to update the state, do any logic, access databases, whatever. The state of the model is going to be updated. The state of the app is going to be updated. And the view is going to access that state. It's going to say, give me that updated state. And then display that state to the user. User sees a different state, can make more inputs, changes the model, views those changes, etc. So in, the, in terms of video games, this would be the user hits a button on the controller. Maybe they hit the jump button sends it to the model, model's gonna do all its physics in, in updating the location of objects, whatever it needs to do. The view is gonna receive that updated state, which is going to be the player increasing height. The user's going to see that player jump and move up in response to that button press. To the user, they hit a button, they saw the change, and the model is in between doing all of the actual logic of that button change, all the physics, anything that needs to happen. Take into account that you have uh, boots that increase your jump height, or, or if you're running or walking or standing still, all that stuff. So let's break these down a little more. The model, this is where your app lives. For 115, 116, this is at least 95% of all the code you've written. Probably uh, at least 95% of the code you've written in your life is model code. It's the core of the app. It's write a method that, that does this, you know, parses a CSV file and does this, you know, whatever it does. Uh, this is where all the action happens. That's where we usually write our assignments is to to build features and build up this model. And that'll be true by the end of 116 too. Probably probably by the end of your third semester even. Uh, most of your code is going in the model because that's where the action is. Why would we have you do the other stuff? Um, and, and the model is completely separate from the other two parts especially the user. The user never touches the model directly when following this architecture. The model gets inputs from the controller and sends outputs to the view. It is not aware of the user. It's not even aware of what type of app it is. Nowhere in your code for project two did you say anything about, nowhere in there did you say anything about Java effects, Scala effects, event listeners, event handlers. You've never touched any of that. You don't have to care. And this is the value of MVC. When you're doing the model, you're focused on the model. You're focused on the logic. How does this machine work? When one of these buttons is pressed, which the methods, I have them named button press, but I can name them anything else. They don't have to be associated with actual buttons. In fact, they're not in your testing. In your testing, they're just being called directly completely detached from the, the GUI. You don't have to care about anything else. You just have to focus on, okay, I got this self-checkout machine. How do I write the software for it? The view is kind of the, the exact opposite of that. It's not concerned about any of the logic. It does absolutely no logic. In pure MVC, the view shouldn't compute anything. It shouldn't change the data. It shouldn't change the state of the app. It shouldn't access a database, shouldn't do anything. All it's doing is getting the state of the app, the current state of the app from the controller, or from the controller, from the model, which in our for our purposes is receipt lines and display number. Those are the values that we send to the view to be displayed on the GUI. And we're going to just output them, just blatantly display them. We might do a little processing, like a, a little formatting to visualize it in the best way that the view wants to display it. But all we're doing is displaying that information to the user. We're not changing that information. The view can't move a player. The view can't update the physics. It, the view can't do any of that. It takes the state of the app and displays it to the user in whatever format it wants to display it. And that's it. Since we have the view separate from the model, it's actually really easy to swap out a view or to have multiple views for the same app. So say you wanted an app that has a web front end, a desktop front end that you install and a mobile app. Think of uh, what's uh, probably Discord, something uh, most of you've seen. 
Discord, you can use the browser version of Discord, the web app, and access their model, their API, their uh, back end of their code, their server code, whatever you want to call it. You can access that through the web front end using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or you can download the desktop version, use their desktop front end, or you can install their mobile app and use their mobile app. All this is is using different views and actually controllers too when we talk about that. That's having different views that all access the same model. So the server doesn't give a damn that you have these three different versions of the app. All it cares is here's my API, here's how you send a message, here's how you change a user's roles, here's how you create a new room. These are all API endpoints. I don't care how you access them, just access them. I don't give a damn that you're a desktop app. That's what the model says. And then the view which makes it very easy to expand and build those extra apps because you're not tied down to one thing. You're not inherently a web front end. Or if you're not using MVC, you're going to have all your code mixed together. And it's going to be a big mess. It's going to be impossible. Not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult to add that mobile app or that desktop app that users want. And finally, the controller. This handles all the user inputs. In ScalaFX, what we saw on Wednesday, these were the event handlers. Whenever we react to an event that the user creates, that's the controller's job. So all those event handlers, that's part of the controller. And this gives a way for, excuse me, the controller, it gives a way for the program in the controller to convert those user inputs to calls to the model API. And this is important. It's So in the handout code for the current project, the controller doesn't do much. It just takes the button presses and then calls the model API. Uh, it doesn't do much, but that's an important step because it allows the model to be abstracted out. The model now doesn't have to care that those are actual button presses on a GUI or if they're simulated button presses in your test suite. The model doesn't care, doesn't care. And that's what we want. And the view doesn't care either. The view just has to say, I'm going to display a button. When that button's pressed, I'm gonna let the controller know. And then the controller can figure out what to do with that button press. Okay, this button press, I need to send that to the GUI. Uh, having this separate makes it easier to swap out the way things are controlled. Say our, our game, uh, the jumper game that we saw, we have left, right, up, and we can use the arrow keys or we can use WASD. Through the controller, we're kind of getting rid of the actual buttons that were pressed and just converting those to API calls of the model. So if we want to do something like add a physical controller, we want to get you know a Microsoft controller and play jumper with this, we can just add that controller, uh, add that physical controller, write a new controller that handles those inputs and converts them into calls to the model. And our model stays the same, our view stays the same, we just add a new controller, a literal an MVC style controller for that new physical controller to be able to control the game using that. So if we have these separated, there are lots of advantages of this. One of the big ones is it's easier to divide work among team members. You agree on the APIs. I'm going to build a model that's going to have these things. It's going to have these endpoints. These are the methods you can call, and these are what they're supposed to, to do generally. And you can add features. You can expand it later. Um, as long as you don't change that API. Now your team member who's working on the view, you're working on the model, your teammates working on the view, they know that they can call those methods, access the state of the model of the app to display it without waiting for you to finish implementing the model. Did I call a Microsoft controller? Is it not a controller? What do you call them? The, uh, they can start working on that code. You can have three team members working on the controller, the model view and controller separately. Did I call it? Oh, I mean, it's a Microsoft controller. I mean, I have it plugged into my desktop right now. I guess it's an Xbox controller, but Microsoft makes it. And it's used for more than just Xbox. I don't know. Did I actually? I didn't think I called it a, a Microsoft controller, but if I did, I'm still going to defend it. Uh, so you can work on the model view and controller independently of each other. You agree on the APIs and you can work in parallel to, uh, uh, to be able to save time. You're not waiting for each other, each other to work. 
hey, are you done with that model yet? Because I really want to start the view. Agree on the API, get working. Uh, it also helps keep your code organized and you can swap out features, uh, like we said. You can add new features, but you can also swap out. You want to swap out the GUI? No big deal. You don't have to touch any of the model code because the model is going to stay the same. You just rewrite your GUI, access the same API endpoints, done. Adding new features is no big deal. I think I deleted that slide. Adding new features is no big deal. If I want to add uh, new game items to the uh, to the jumper game, I want to have players being able to throw things at each other or something like that, kind of mix that dodgeball idea with the jumper. I can do that without changing the view in the controller, at least the controller. Um, the view has to be able to render those new objects. I might need some new graphics for those. But other than that, I'm changing the model, not changing the model's API. I'm just changing what happens when those API methods are called. Nothing else has to change. If I want to change the way the jump behaves, I don't have to talk to the view at all. I don't have to change that code at all. Professional is overrated. Uh, so if we want to do MVC on the web, the browser is going to run your view. That's your entire view is the browser. The, the web kind of forces us to separate model view and controller to an extent. Um, the view is going to run in the browser. The controller kind of runs on, on the server and the browser where JavaScript is the bridge between uh, between them, the JavaScript in the browser, and then you can have some more controller code in the on the server itself, and then the model runs the entire server. So we kind of have this natural split, except the controller, it's a little iffy what, what parts are the controller, and it really just depends on what you call the controller uh, and where you draw the lines between controller, model, and view. Um, but we get this pretty natural split. And then we want to add a desktop front end. Maybe I want pe people to play jumper against each other where one person's on the web and one person's on desktop. No big deal. It's just another view. It's just another controller. Uh, and the the view for jumper, I just want to highlight this one. I said the, the rest of the stuff already. Uh, but the view does a little bit of processing. It doesn't change the state of the game at all. It doesn't really handle change the data or update anything but it does do some processing to figure out what to display to the user. So the model keeps track of the entire state of the game as like from the user view, you're, uh, you're scrolling vertically. But when I write the model, I don't care about the scrolling. The scrolling doesn't really matter to me at that point. I, I need to know where the kill line is. So I need to know where the bottom of the screen is going to be. But, I, but other than that, I'm going to maintain the entire state of the game. All the platforms, whether they're visible or not, all exist to the model, and the model doesn't know what the viewer is going to be able to see. That's the view's job. The view gets that entire, uh, the entire state of the game and then figures out, okay, my players are here and here. I need to show the players this section of the game. That's the section that I'm actually going to render and show to the user. That frees up the model to not have to think about scrolling, and it frees up the the view to be able to be flexible. If I want to show, uh, if I want to foreshadow more information, more platforms, I can just do that in the view. I don't have to mess with the model at all. I can just do that in one spot in the code. So for point of sale, very similar. We have the model, which is going to be all all of the methods, all the button press methods and the receipt lines in display string. The view is the entire GUI that we looked at on Wednesday. And then the controller is kind of that glue between them. It takes those button presses, those button pressed events. And when it handles those events, it's going to forward that to the model API, um, the model API calls appropriate for that button. So, yeah, I already got ahead of my slides on this one. But your model is not aware that it's a ScalaFX app at all. You didn't write any ScalaFX code. You wrote this API. You implemented that API. You don't care where those button press methods are coming from. You just implement the API. You don't know that it's a ScalaFX app. If I never told you that's a ScalaFX app and I just said, don't worry about the view and controller packages, 
you'd be blissfully happy to just write your app and not be aware that it even could connect to a ScalaFX app. If you never ran the GUI, you, you didn't pop through there and see that GUI and say, what's this, and run it, you'd be blissfully unaware that this even could be connected to a ScalaFX app and have an actual GUI front end to it. So what could we do with this? If we want a new GUI, we're gonna, we can write a new view, a new controller. They'll call that controller, we'll call the same API methods, the button press methods. The view will call the same receipt lines and uh, and display string methods, and we can rebuild a new front end using the same exact back end. That functionality you're building, this isn't some toy project that you're just writing some code for, for an assignment. I mean, you, you are, I guess, but that code can really be used. That's a real, that's a real piece of software that can really scan items, and then, you know, we don't have the purchases. You can't scan a credit card and, and make payments and accept payments. We could always expand functionality. Um, but that software that you wrote for that assignment or are currently writing, you could build an actual self-checkout machine, upload your code to that machine. Your code runs on Java, which runs on like 5 billion devices, you know, everything, especially embedded, uh, especially everything, I should say, everything runs Java. So your model, you compile it to Java bytecode, upload it to that machine that runs Java, you write a controller, you have to write new controller code that connects the physical button presses on that machine to calls of your API. The controller's already there, presumably if you build this machine, it's the actual physical buttons, or sorry, the view. The view is already there, it's the actual physical buttons, and it's the actual physical displays. That's your view, it's actually in the real world. And you have those call the right API methods to get the receipt lines, get the display lines, uh, the display string, you have the physical buttons, call your methods uh, that send signals to your code and calls your API, your model API methods, and you actually have an actual working self-checkout machine. Not to say that it's easy, obviously you got to get into some hardware to, to write that controller, but your code can run an actual self-checkout machine. There's, this is 100% real software that you're writing, and of course you can make profit. And I actually have a step two. We know how to make profit in this field. So let's talk quickly about databases too. Before I run out of time, I do want to get through this because I don't want to revisit databases later. Uh, so I'll get this out there for those of you doing the project contribution once I get that stuff out. So you've seen SQLite in 115. I'm going to talk about MySQL. So I want to highlight the differences between these. I only have a few slides on databases. I don't want, I'm not going to talk about this too much. Uh, but MySQL, it's a database server, which is a separate piece of software that's going to run on your machine, and you're going to connect to this server and be able to send it SQL statements for that server to execute. But it is a completely separate piece of software running on your machine. Just like when you run a web server, you, you would have to spin up that web server, have that running, waiting for HTTP requests. And then you can open up your browser and then send HTTP requests to that server like you did in 115. MySQL is a very similar thing. You're going to run MySQL, its software. You have to download it to your machine, run that software, and have it running in the background waiting for connections. And then you run your software and code that to connect to the MySQL software that's already running through its API, which takes uh, SQL statements. And then you can communicate with your database, um, uh, with your database server. Your database server can be running on a different machine. You might be connecting to it over the internet to be able to connect to your database. SQLite uh, removes a lot of this functionality. This is how databases really, uh, by and large, work as a database server. SQLite that you did in 115 uh, intentionally simplifies all of this, cuts out all the networking, cuts out all the any of the complexity, and just runs in the same app that you're uh, that you're developing and then it uses file io instead of um you know uh, mysql i guess under the hood mysql uses file io too but it, you just have that one database file it creates it right in your project and it just simplifies everything which makes it really great for uh for 115. Uh, and this is used if you're going to do some mobile app development sqlite's uh very common in that area uh, so you can still be using SQLite in your career if you're doing mobile apps. 
So MySQL, you download it, you install it, you go to MySQL.com or whatever the website is, or just click the link that I linked to on the course website. Uh, you download it, you install it, you run it. That database server is going to be listening on port 3306, like your web servers. Um, I believe we used 8080. They're probably still using 8080 in, in uh, 115. Uh, it's very common, 8080 and 8000. Um, so you run your web server on port 8080, and then you can connect to it. MySQL does a similar thing, but it's going to run on port 3306. Instead of listening for HTTP requests, it's going to listen for MySQL requests. It, it opens a TCP socket and has its own protocols. To connect to it, to speak those protocols, we're going to use JDBC, the Java Database Connectivity uh, Library, that protocol. We're going to use that to connect to MySQL. So we need JDBC in our code. That's how we're going to send these SQL statements. And then we connect to the database on port 3306, and we can start sending it those SQL statements. So this is what that, that looks like in our code. And I have examples in the repo. You can check them out. Uh, after you install, download, install, and run MySQL, and you're going to set up a username and password in the install script. It'll ask you for a root password to set the root password. You can set up user accounts too instead of using root. I'm just going to use root for my example. Um, but the password is going to be whatever password you set up when you install MySQL. Then we want to connect to it. We're going to use this database manager .get connection. This is part of JDBC. And this is going to expect the URL of our database. Uh, I added this query string, server time zone. This fixed uh, a bug that I was having. So if you add the string, you won't run into that same bug that I experienced. And then the username and password. That will connect to the database, and we can use this connection to start interacting with MySQL. Now, this right here is a very bad thing. I want to take a, a quick time out to talk about this one. Never, never have your password hard-coded in your code like this. If you do this, everybody with access to your code has access to your database because they have your username and password. They can take that username and password and connect to it, steal your data, change your data, give themselves admin privileges on your server, etc. Uh, they can, yeah, I, I, I think I do use the same slide in 199. I do reuse slides sometimes. If you take enough classes with me, you'll see, you might see the same slide like three times. So uh, so never check this into version control, especially if you have a Git repository, a short Git repository. Don't check a password into that repository. This is just general advice. Do not do this. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, I don't use this password. If you're uploading a password, make sure you're always changing that before you go to deploy. Uh, if you've heard of the Equifax leak, this is actually how that happened. They were using default, uh, Not I, I didn't even say this yet. Uh, they were using default passwords. If you use software, you purchase software, use some open source software, a lot of times it'll come with a default password, uh, like admin, admin, or admin and password as the default username and password. It'll be something like that for a lot of pieces of software. This is public, it's known, like you ha everybody knows what the default password is, and you're expected to change that as soon as you, uh, as soon as you install that software, as soon as you start using it. Well, at Equifax, they didn't do that. It wasn't with MySQL, but they just didn't change the default passwords. So guess who knows their passwords? Literally everybody who gives a damn and who wants to bother with that anyway. Uh, and then they had this huge leak, huge data leak all over the news and everything because they were just sloppy with the way they were handling their passwords. So don't do that. Uh, you might think, well, who's going to attack my little app? Well, the attackers actually scan IP addresses and looking for common vulnerabilities or default passwords or whatever it may be. Uh, and they'll, they'll find you. Eventually, they're going to find you. They're going to be like, oh, hey, here's some little website that I my bot flagged and said they're vulnerable to this attack because they use this default password for MySQL. I'm going to – actually, I don't think MySQL has a default password, but certain setups might. So I'm going to attack them. I'm going to steal their data, poke around, see what they got. Maybe just take over your machine and make, turn it into a zombie, put it in part of a botnet, and uh, start mining bitcoins with your GPU. You know, they can do whatever they want once you're using a default password like that. So once we're finally connected to that MySQL server, we can start sending it these statements. A little bit of syntax. I won't dwell on this too much. It's just syntax. Um, but we take that connection that we created, 
create a statement from it, and then execute a, a, uh, a SQL statement just by giving it SQL. Always use your prepared statements. Those of you who did take 199, uh, depending on the semester, I guess, know about your prepared statements. Never use string concatenation when you're taking user data and sending user data into a database. So we're always going to use prepared statements. It's different for each library, for each way of, of doing this. But it'll always look similar to this. Every time I've seen it, it had this syntax. But after that, how, is a little different. Is using these question marks. So when you get to the data that you actually want to insert, just put these question marks there. And then replace those question marks using whatever syntax you have. With MySQL, you would uh, add a second argument here with a list of all of the parameters that you want, uh, all the arguments that you want to inject in here. Uh, with uh, in Scala, it's a little bit different. We're going to take that statement and set a value based on its type by position, which do start at one. So one would be this position, and I want to put Mario there. Two would be this position. I want to put the int ten there, and then we execute the statement. This way, if somebody sends me, if I say, "Hey, what's your what's your player name?" and they type in uh, drop tables, it's on the next slide, drop table players, I'm not going to treat that as part of a SQL statement. I'm going to treat that as their literal string for their player name. So I'm not actually going to drop my tables. I'm not executing that as SQL. I'm treating that as a specific value that's going to be entered into that field of the SQL table. If you're using string concatenation, you're vulnerable to SQL injection, and that's bad news. Somebody's going to steal your data. Somebody's going to give themselves admin privileges. Somebody's going to steal credit card numbers, whatever they want to do with your data. They have access to your whole database if you're vulnerable to SQL injections. And if we want to get information from the database, legitimately, not an attacker, uh, we're going to execute a query instead of a statement. A query, the difference being a query is expected to return data. And to get that data, we have to use an iterator. We're going to use, this is going to return a result set when we execute the query. And that result set has two, three that we're using. It has some important methods. Uh, the most important one is next. What next is going to do is queue up the next result of the query. Once that result is queued up, then we can do get string, get int, get whatever we want, whatever types we want by key name. So when we created this table, we have keys, uh, we have columns, username and points. So I can get the username and get the points for this specific row in the database. So when I say result dot get string of username, I'm saying, give me the value at the column username, and I expect that to be a string, so give it to me as a Scala string, and then I should have my type here. The username is of type string. Score is of type int. Give me this value in the column points. Give, return it as a Scala int, and give me that data. And then I'm just adding it to a, a data structure so I can do whatever I want later with it. And then I'm going to call result.next again. That queues up the next result. And then I keep getting my information and adding it to this map. Next returns a Boolean. And this is how iterators work. You'll get into iterators in 250. You'll get into them pretty heavy. Uh, this is how iterators work, though. Next is going to queue up the next result and return a Boolean, which is true if there was a next result to queue up, and false if we've already read all the data. So I put this in a while loop, and I say, well, I'm effectively saying, well, there's something next to queue. Queue it up and execute this. And then once there's nothing left to queue, once I've read all the data from this query, go on with the program and do whatever we need to do. You did read a while loop. It's one of the sad things. We don't really talk about while loops too much in 115. It's by design why we do that. But a, a while loop, and I put a while loop in one of the quizzes, and it blew minds. Like It was such a terrible question. Everybody got it so horribly wrong. Most of y'all, like half of y'all at least, didn't know how many times a while loop's going to execute. Um, a while loop is going to execute as long as this is true. You can read this as an if statement that's going to execute, but after it reaches the end, it's going to check the condition again. And it's going to keep executing 
well this is true. So as long as this returns true, this body keeps getting executed in the loop. And once it's false, then the loop exits. They're useful in certain situations, less useful in others. This is a case where we really need to use a well loop. There's no data structure that we can use a for loop, a, uh, a for each loop for. Are data structures and databases different? Yes. Like my map here is a data structure. My SQL server is a database. SQLite was a database. Lists, dictionaries, those are all data structures is the difference. Uh, are examples of the differences anyway. Uh, SQL works on this row and columns. It's very much like a CSV file. Uh, if we want to do something different, like for CSV, we made the shift from using the CSV format to JSON when we wanted more complexity in our structure of the data that we store. Uh, a similar shift is moving from SQL to something, uh, a non-technically non-relational database like MongoDB, where it stores more of a JSON format. Uh, MongoDB pretty much uses JSON, you know, you can think of it like that. It uses BSON, but, you know, we're not talking about that right now. And um, so you can do that switch or SQL has what's called joins where you can have multiple tables and then merge them together multiple tables with different types of data and merge them together when you need to, if you want to store more complex uh, data with more complex interactions. Which, uh, oh, and I'm three minutes early. I was trying to watch the clock on that one, but three minutes over anyway. So let's, uh, let's end that. And for those of you, uh, for those of you who are just gonna, you know, cut loose for a week, uh, I'll see you uh, when will I see you? The 22nd. I'll see you then. For those of you hanging out this week, I'll see you Monday. And regardless, have a good weekend or a good week. And I'll see everyone on either Monday or next Monday.